pray this in Jesus' name. Reading this morning is from the book of Galatians, Paul's letter to the Galatians, uh, Galatians chapter 5, and from verses 16. And, uh, <coughs> Steve Rowley is going to be reading for us. Uh, it will be up on the screen or simply listen to God's word this morning. the desires of the flesh. The flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do whatever you want. If you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness. Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If you live by the Spirit, let us keep in touch with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, envying each other. Word of the Lord. We're busy with a series. This is week three of the four-part series. The series is uh, called, What Do You Really Want? What do you really want? Now I want to talk about beginning at the end. Um, <clears throat> the question we've been asking uh, through the series is this very simple but very difficult question. What do you really want? What do you really want? And we, we saw that it's Difficult sometimes for us to answer that question honestly, um, <clears throat> uh, because sometimes we don't know what we want, and sometimes we know what we want, but we we feel embarrassed about it or something else. Uh, and sometimes we've got the thing that we want, what that we want, the who that we want, the house that we want, the car that we want, the job that we want, the promotion that we want, the thing that we thought we wanted, only to discover that it's not what we wanted at all. And I'm sure you, you know people like this. It's always about the next thing. They, they're never content. It's always about the, the next promotion or the next job or uh, the next thing that and they, they, they say, or they might not say it as blatantly as this, but when I get that thing, my life will be perfect. And you know, no, it's not. It doesn't work that way. Last week we looked at three questions. Uh, and I invited you to think about these through the week. What do I really want? What's dragging me away? What's pulling me away from what I really want? How long do I plan to let what I naturally want drag me away from what I ultimately want? How long are you prepared? How long am I prepared to continue that process in my life? We saw also that lurking in the shadows of what we want is what we value, the things that are of value to us, what is important to us. And said that you'll never get what you really want until you discover what you really value. You'll never get what you really want until you discover what you really value. So as well, last week spoke about this fact that what we naturally want is often in conflict with what we ultimately value. What we, are, what we want now is often in conflict with what we ultimately value. And so what happens is we get what we want now, but it leaves us unfulfilled because it's not what we value. Then last week I said, uh, we talked a little bit about life verses, you know, this game that church people play, Christians play, you know, what's your life verse? Oh, mine's Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you, 
Mine's Philippians 4.13. Uh, you know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, my life verse from now on is Romans 7 verse 15. I do not understand what I do. Do not understand what I do. But what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Paul talks about this struggle that goes within us between what we want, what we know we should do, what we ultimately value, and, and what we want. Now, this struggle that goes on inside of us. And, <clears throat> and that's where we got to last week. So this week, I want to talk a lot about value, and what is important to you. I'm going to share a bit about my own journey in this for you, uh, not because I think uh, that I'm anyway, uh, my journey is anyway special, but because um, to, to show you how this worked in my own life a little bit, and then we'll, we'll dive into the scriptures. Uh, so there, were, there, were, there were a couple of things that were very influential in my own kind of development of this. And the first was in the, in the mid-1980s, you remember Don Francisco? Um, I love Don Francisco's music. He's a kind of, he tells tales in his music. But I heard this song. I'm going to, Bimasani is going to play it for you in a little while. <coughs> I heard this, this song from Don Francisco and it touched me very deeply about the kind of husband and father I wanted to be one day. And, um, and it, it kind of formed, it began to form in me. I was also beginning to, to uh, considering a call to ministry, I was still quite young. I had lots of hair. I was much, I weighed a lot less than I do today. Um, and uh, I was considering this call to ministry. And I, I was thinking about what kind of minister I wanted to be one day. When I came across this song, and this song deeply touched me. Over the years, whenever I hear it, it, it moves me. And particularly, I want you to pay attention to the... Uh, to the chorus. That's the most important part. And when you play it. Doesn't matter how steep your steeple is, if it's sitting on a cemetery. I don't care if you pave your parking lot or put pads upon your pews. What good is a picture perfect stage if you're missing all the cues? I don't care if your pastor's super powered and your program's always new. What you need is love and truth, and men are gonna come to you. It doesn't matter that you know the Bible, if it's all just in your head. The thing I need to ask you. Have you done the things I said? Do you love your wife? For her and for your children, are you laying down your life? What about the others? Are you living as a servant to your sisters and your brothers? Do you make the poor man thank you for a bowl? Do the widow and the orphan cry alone? I don't care if you pray for miracles. I don't care if you speak with tongues. I don't care if you said you love me in every song you've sung. It doesn't matter that your sacrifice and praise is loud enough to raise the dead. The thing I need to ask you is, have you done the things I said? Do you love your wife? For her and for your children, are you laying down the life? What about the others? Living as a servant to your sisters and your brothers, do you make the poor man beg you for a bowl? Do the widow and the orphan cry alone? Lord, when were you prisoner that we did not come to you? When was it that we saw you sick? 
that we didn't follow through. Every time you turned your head and pretended not to see, and when you did it not to the least of these, you did it not to me. Do you love your wife? With all you've got inside you, are you laying down your life? What about the others? Are you living as a servant to your sisters and your brothers? Do you make the poor man beg you for a bowl? Do the widow and the orphan cry alone? So that was the that was the one thing that really influenced my sort of thinking as a as a person before I was married, before I had children, before I was in ministry. That was that shaped the kind of person that I wanted to be. The second uh, happened in about 1993. Came home to be forced in about 1993. I was then 26. Uh, Sally was 24. We were living in Peter Maritzburg. Jamie was one. We only had one child then. Jamie was one. We lived with nine children from the children's home in a, in a house in Peter Maritzburg. The children were aged between five and 18. They went to six different schools. All schools had school meetings, uh, which we were expected to attend as house parents. Well, Sadie was expected to attend as a house parent. Um, <clears throat> I was studying, I was at varsity full time, trying to finish. Uh, theology degree. I was working at the church as a youth pastor full time uh, and I thought I was going to go off my head. I thought I was going to go mad. Uh, it was a crazy time in our lives and uh, I came across this book by Stephen Covey. You may have read this book. This book literally saved my life in 1993 when I read it. Um, and in fact, there were lessons in this book that were so powerful to me that they, it became my motto for my three years as moderator of the General Assembly. Uh, for those of you who are new to our system, we have a, a General Assembly, we have churches in three countries, in Zimbabwe, Zambia, and, and South Africa, and every year, every two years, we elect somebody who has some leadership role in all those churches, and for three years, I served in that role, although I was still the minister here, I did that as well. And my motto... Uh, which I'll tell you about a bit later, as moderator of the General Assembly, came from something Stephen Covey writes in this book. And he writes, uh, in this book, he writes about a funeral. He says, imagine you're going to a funeral, and you arrive, and you, uh, you, know, you, you walk in, and you see that the music is playing, you see people there, people that you've known, and uh, you walk up to the front, and there's a, the coffin is there, and you go up to the coffin, you look inside, and you see yourself in the coffin. It's your funeral. You think, well, this should be interesting. So you go and you sit in the pew, and uh, <clears throat> and you listen to the you know the worship songs and so on, and the music is played and so on. And there are four speakers. The four speakers were well, somebody from your family, somebody that you worked with, uh, a friend, and somebody that you serve with in some sort of organisation. So if you're a church person, a church member, or you work in a charity, something like that, um, <clears throat> and they. They speak about the kind of person that you that you were. They, they, they do a eulogy. Stephen Covey says this in the book, and the quote is there up on the screen. If you carefully consider what you wanted to be said of you in the funeral experience, you will find your definition of success. When you think through that process, what you hear on that day, what those four people say about you, you will find your definition of success. You will know what is most important to you, what is most valuable to you, what means the most to you, and I will guarantee you this, it will have virtually nothing to do with any accomplishment that you think matters. It will have everything to do with your character and the way in which you treated people. I do funerals for people I don't know, people I've never met. And I've discovered an interesting thing in those funerals. 
that if I didn't know the work that they did, or if, if somebody with whom they work doesn't stand up and say, you know, we worked together in this office and we did this work, if that doesn't happen, I would not know the kind of work they did in their lifetime. Here's, here's a reality check. The thing you spend eight to ten hours a day doing for six or seven days a week will not even get a mention at your funeral. It forms zero part of your legacy. It does not feature. This, this quote, this from, from Stephen Covey's book, this part of Stephen Covey's book, was so influential in me, as I said, that when I was moderator for the three years, my motto was to live your legacy. To live your legacy. <coughs> because whether we want it or not, we're going to have a legacy. We're going to leave something behind us when we leave. And we begin to live now what we want to leave behind us. The interesting thing between that, that song by Don Francisco and Stephen Covey's kind of focus on this for me, sin became synonymous with betraying my own legacy. What do I mean by this? What I mean by this is when I didn't live in a way that reflected the values that were in that song, when I didn't love my wife, when I didn't live as a servant to others, when I didn't regard the poor, I felt that in my own self. It was sin because I wasn't living out the kind of legacy that I wanted to leave. <coughs> Let me say this. I don't help out with the chores at home. I don't help out. I do work in the home because I want to model to my well, for my wife and my children and my household, what it means to be a servant. When I don't do that, I feel that. When I stand on my own rights or I demand my own way or whatever, which happens far too often than it should. Now, now the question is, so you say you're not susceptible to sin like ordinary people. No, of course. But the, the, things that, the things that affect me most deeply are the moments when I know I haven't lived up to what I know I value the most. But the interesting thing about this is when I, when I own my own failures, when I admit them to myself or to the people around me, that in itself becomes success. When I say to those around me, I'm sorry, I, I didn't live up to this, I didn't treat you as I should, that in itself becomes success success. It's to get what you really want, you must discover what you really value. To get what you really want, you must know what you really value. What is most important to you. You can't prioritize what is most important to you until you discover what is most important to you. And that takes time. And I know people who go through their whole lives without discovering this for themselves. You can go through your whole life without knowing what is most important to you. Because it's not natural for us to reflect on it. <coughs> now, as, as church people, as Christians, we have a further, there's a further component to us. Because this is true of all people, but we have, a, we have an added layer to this, and it's this question, what does God really want? What does God really want? And the thing is, <clears throat> the question is this, what does God really want for us? What does God really want for us? We, we worry. And sometimes it's people who don't believe in God are, are in this place, or sometimes we, we have a, a deep faith in God, but we worry that what God wants and what we want are in conflict with one another. We think that the issue is, what does God want from us? And friends, God wants nothing from us. 
God wants nothing from you. There is nothing you can give God that God needs. Remember when Jesus, and Luke's gospel puts it this way, Jesus is busy praying. The disciples say to Jesus, teach us to pray. And he teaches them. And what does he tell them to say? What are the first words in that prayer? Our Father. He says, you can call God your Father. What does a good parent want from their children? Well, nothing. Good parents want stuff for their children. And when, and we've all known parents who live off their kids. They want stuff from their children. They, they want to be validated. They want to, their children to do well so they look good. When we see that, we identified as dysfunction. God is, the, is a good, good father, as the song says. He doesn't want stuff from us. He wants stuff for us. You might be far closer to what God wants for you than you ever imagined. And it's in that reading that, that Steve read for us today in Galatians chapter 5. Paul says this, for the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, the result of the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life is love, it's joy, it's peace. Some of you might think, well, you know, maybe not so much us. If you're not a church person or you're not a Christian or you kind of just on the fringes, you might think, well, what, what good does love, joy, and peace? You know, what, what difference does that make in my life? Well, well don't, you, don't you want the best for people around you? Don't you want to know the deep contentment that all will be well no matter what the circumstances? Don't you want that internal sense of wholeness and completeness no matter what is going on around you. That's what he's promised here. Love, the best for others. Joy, that deep sense of contentment. Peace, a sense of wholeness and completeness. No matter what is going on around you. These are the products. These are the outflows of those who have surrendered their life to Christ. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace. You'll see in this new translation, forbearance has taken the place of patience. More or less the same word. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You might think, oh, you know, if I had to you know, try and do all of this, how would I get anything done? If, if I was you know, producing all of this, how would I do anything? Well, remember that this was written by the Apostle Paul who did more than any of us have done, and he didn't have electricity. Paul says this, verse 25, he says, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Here he's going back to something Jesus did. Sometimes we worry. We think, you know, I can't get my head around all of this stuff, and, and some of this stuff is so heavy for me, and I don't know about all of the Bible, or I, I, I battle to understand the Trinity, or there's certain things that I can't fathom. Some of it's just a mystery. I don't know how to work it out, and it kind of is a real problem for us. Jesus said to those who came to him, follow. Follow me. We will go together. We will accomplish more than you ever thought possible because we will do it together. If you think about that list, imagine if we, were, if we were just expending all of our energy in following Jesus and being close to him and doing what he did. We wouldn't waste our energy on regret, on, uh, on, 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 on all the stuff, on unforgiveness, on resentment, on all the stuff that piles on top of us. Think of all the energy that's expended. Be free of that. Galatians 5.26, Paul says this, Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying one another. 
imagine if you're in your in your classroom or in your company or in your workplace, this was this was put up nice and bold, <laughs> nice big writing. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying one another. Imagine if we took that to heart. But we value love and joy and peace and all the others because that's what we want in the people we meet. That's what we want in others, and so we want it for ourselves. The question is, what do you really want? What do you really want? And the fact is, what you want and what God wants for you are probably far closer than you ever thought about it before. I want to invite you. It's not a it's not a morbid exercise, I promise you. But I want you to I want to invite you to do the eulogy exercise at some point. Really do it. How do you want to be remembered? What do you want to be remembered for? Three years time or five years time, if if your funeral were to take place, what would people what would you want people to say about you? then start living it. Because when you discover what you really value, you'll be less prone to settle for what you merely want. These are difficult things for us to be honest about. Because for so long, we've been dishonest with ourselves and with others. Lord, it's, it's, it's unnatural for us to talk about what is valuable and what means the most to us because we, we're not educated that way. We're not trained that way. But Lord, thank you that when we do start thinking about that, when we do begin to come to terms with it, you begin to help us to understand that what we want and what you want are actually far closer than we ever thought possible. Help us, Lord, to really value what you value, to want what you want for us. Be the kind of people that you desire us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name.